Let's look together in this session of look at the book at verse 14 of 1 Peter chapter 4. And let's ask the question which this verse is meant to answer. How does God come personally to help us in our persecution so that we are not left to ourselves to endure? And the approach we'll take is to note very carefully uh, the connections between uh, 13 and 14 because that really is important here. And then pondering digging down deep into a couple of the key terms and then seeing an analogy in Paul to help us answer our question. Father, I pray that you would show us the glory of your personal approach to us in our trouble so that we don't ever despair that we are left alone. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So rejoice now in your sufferings so that you can rejoice and be glad later when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory... And of God rests upon you. We'll come back to that connection in a minute. So what I like to do, as you've noticed, if you've looked at the other sessions in this unit, is break a verse up into its key parts. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. And then break them out. This is verse 14, broken out. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. So let's just take these one at a time. If you are insulted, in in what sense are we insulted for the name of Christ? What, What would that look like? And according to Peter, just a few verses earlier, we saw a description of it. The time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, lawless idolatry with respect to this lifestyle that you now are giving up. With respect to this, they are surprised when you don't join them. You don't join them in the same flood of debauchery. So this, they're not doing anymore. Result? Insult. So this is the concrete illustration in the context of what Peter means by when you are insulted. It's not just that you're doing some great magnanimous deed in the name of Jesus. It's that you're not doing the wicked things that they were doing. You're not living with them in their sensuality and passions and drunkenness and orgies. And they're calling you names like legalist, square, uncool, out of it judgmental. That's what the maligning looks like in First Peter in this context. So you're insulted because the name of Christ has driven you to change your, your behaviors, and they don't like it. It makes them feel judged, and that's not your problem. You love them. And you do many good and beautiful things, and God willing, they will give glory to your Father in heaven someday. If you are insulted this way, you are blessed, which sounds so much like Matthew 5, 11, with a very big difference. Remember that text, Matthew 5? Blessed are you when others revile you. This is that same word of insult, revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice, rejoice in that day and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. 
So, you are blessed, Jesus said, because you've got a, a great reward in heaven. So, put your eyes on the future and take heart and be glad in that glorious reward, which is not what he says here. Here, he says something also wonderful and very personally encouraging when you ponder whether you will ever be able to survive serious persecution. You are blessed because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Now, let's go back here to get rid of these. Here's verse 13. Rejoice and be glad. Um, No, let's see. Rejoice when you share Christ's sufferings so that you will be able to rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. That's the great reward that's coming. His glory is going to be revealed someday. Rejoice and be glad now in sufferings so that you'll be able to be glad when his glory comes. And now verse 14 says, the spirit of glory And surely it's got to be this glory in the same context. The spirit of glory rests now on you. Now. There's the great and glorious new thing that's being said in verse 14. He's not telling us that we're blessed because we have some future reward. He's telling us that we're blessed because because now rests present, rests upon you. The Spirit of glory, the Spirit of God, the divine Spirit of glory, which we saw back in verse 13, was the glory that's coming at the end of the age. Now, what does that mean? That presently we experience the future glory of Christ. Here's a, here's a hint. Here's chapter 1, verse 8. Though you have not seen him, You love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorified joy. What's that mean? You now rejoice with inexpressible and glorified joy. Well, wouldn't at least one possible and likely answer be that when the spirit of glory rests upon you, your joy in your hope is presently participating in that glory and can be called a glorified joy right now. Here's another suggestion. Chapter 1, 17 and 18 of Ephesians. This is Paul praying for an experience for Christians. May God give you a spirit of wisdom and a revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know, know with the eyes of your heart, not just with the mind, know with the eyes of your heart what is the hope which he's called you, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance. So the riches of the glory of his inheritance known now, now. That's what Paul is praying. May the eyes of your hearts be enlightened now to know now this this hope about the riches of the glory of the inheritance. So let's try to sum up what this would mean. What what is this experience? Because this this is glorious. When I sometimes think, will I be able to endure serious persecution if it ever were to come to me, real threats to my danger, not just insults, but but real threats to my life or my family's life, would I be able to endure? And and the answer of the Bible is, he's going to come and help me. You're going to be blessed when that happens because the spirit of glory is going to be there on you, on you. God is going to do something extraordinary for you in the times when you need it most. So what, what would that experience look like? And here's the way I would sum it up. That experience is going to be seeing glory, seeing glory as real and, and valuable, supremely valuable valuable over all this world that's about to be taken away 
it would mean not only seeing, but tasting glory as supremely satisfying so that I don't have huge regrets that this world is being taken away, like Paul says, to die is gain. And thirdly, that experience of the presence of the Spirit of glory would mean I feel, would mean feeling great assurance that we will Rejoice in Christ forever. So the, the great truth of this passage uh, is that it goes beyond verse 13, which says you've got great glory coming. This verse adds, and that glory that is coming is resting on you in the moment of your greatest need with the ability to see it as real and valuable and the taste of it as supremely satisfying and a strong assurance that it means you're going to make it to the end and enjoy God forever.